The following is a presentation of iRacing.com Motorsport Simulations on LSR TV, the voice of sim racing. And welcome to those of you watching on Facebook Live and YouTube. This is LSR TV's coverage of the RealSimRacing.com Full Throttle Cup Series presented by Gary Mercer Trucking. I am James Pike, joined tonight in the booth for the first time by Race Chaser Online's Northeastern correspondent Kyle Souza. Hanging up here up top side on the wonderful Monster Mile Dover International Speedway with me. And as always, we've got Cisco Scaramuza punching buttons down in our virtual production trailer. And Sousa, uh, we'll, we'll put you on a, I guess, easy path to start and give you a slow ball here to hit. Because it might not necessarily be a northeastern track, this. Uh, but... I feel like, and especially because I know you know all of the good short tracks up that way well, that this in a lot of ways feels like a northeastern track, maybe one of the short tracks up that way, kind of on steroids. It's a little bit bigger than them, but it, it definitely feels like it races a lot, like some of the great tracks you see in the Modified Series and the late models show up on every summer and every fall. Yeah, James, uh, I think the characteristics of this track are uh, definitely very similar to some of the short tracks up here, and I think uh, you see a lot of this track is uh, built on how much drive you can have up off the corner and carry the speed down the straightaway and then to dive off into the next one. I think we'll talk a lot tonight about uh, these cars landing into the corner, into the banking, and sliding up the track. So uh, it's definitely a lot of things to keep monitored on at a track like this. And being a short track, these guys are pretty close. These straightaways are uh, pretty narrow, and the exit to the corner can get a little hairy sometimes as well. Wouldn't be Dover without the exit of the corner tightening up on you even more than you think it possibly could when you feel like you don't really have any room to begin with. So... Uh, two guys, though, that do have room because they are already into the round of 12 in our playoffs based off of their wins here in the round of 16. David Washington, David Comstock. They are clear. We'll see them race for spot in the round of eight starting next week when we head to Charlotte. But the guys you want to watch here in the tight battle, I think you really have to keep note of anybody from Dwayne Vincent all the way back to Sean Casto. Uh, to Vincent, 20 points behind the leaders and 20 points clear of the drop. Sean Casto currently five points behind Shane Ewing at that first cutoff spot. And Daniel Everhart currently holds the last place in the round of 12 and has a three-point margin ahead of Ewing. So I'd say realistically anybody within that group could slide in or out of the playoffs depending on how things shake out tonight but for the likes of ewing and crowder and casto it will be a very very tense and tricky night i have to believe that there's going to be just that little extra bit of pressure driving them to go get the win than you would normally see on rsr race night yeah, I think the uh, the bottom of those uh, playoff standings, especially 12th, 13th, 14th, as you mentioned, is going to be a stressful night for them. And this is, uh, we talked a little bit about it a moment ago, but definitely one of the more stressful tracks that these guys will visit uh, this season that they've already visited. And we're here tonight to uh, continue the playoffs. And I think these playoffs are going to start heating up a little bit more right now. Uh, I mentioned the exit to the corner. I think that's something we'll have to monitor all night with somebody on the bottom of somebody else sliding up the track. And uh, as we know, a short track like this, anybody can be collected in anything at any time. And sometimes there's just nowhere to go at a place like this when somebody crashes in front of you. So uh, I think that's a fair statement saying that somebody could slide in, somebody could slide out. And that uh, points battle could be a, even a little bit tighter when we're done here tonight. 
Yeah, I think corner exit in particular because it's really easy to throw too much throttle into these rear tires on corner exit and spin yourself around. And at most places, people tend to wash up towards that wall, but here everybody washes down because of the banking. So if you have any driver stuck on the bottom as someone is spinning around from the top side, that is a one-way ticket to problems and trouble. And more often than not, you get caught up behind them. You're down on pit road for at least 20, 30 minutes just trying to fix the damage that you have. And even then, when you come back out onto the racetrack, you're just out there racing for points. You won't be in contention for the win at all. Even though this isn't necessarily the most aero-sensitive track. Much more of an acceleration track, I think, than anything else. But... All these are storylines to be watched over the course of the evening, and I think more importantly, it's time to turn to tonight's LSR TV starting grid, which is led off by the number 45 of Carl Shedd, who's your pole sitter for tonight's race with a 22.174, beating out teammate Dylan Jones by one thousandth of a second. Andrew Farinars will start from the third position tonight, joined by David Washington, who has already clinched his place in the round of 12. David Comstock, the other David who's been up at the front of this field almost all season long, also in the round of 12 by virtue of a victory here. He'll be starting from the fifth position. Lionel Calixto starts on the outside of row three in sixth. Daniel Eberhardt will roll off tonight from the seventh position. Sean Bounty starts eighth, and then it is Nick Silver and Trevor Rompolo starting ninth and tenth here at the Monster Mile. Uh, just up the outside that top ten, uh, James J, uh, Gabe Wood and Tanner Tolarico in that uh, sixth row on the grid. This kind of that mid-pack we'll have to keep watch on, especially at the start. Dwayne Vincent, Seth DeMerchant, follow him in row number seven. Uh, and then we got Rod Flagg and Corey Wolf, 15th and 16th, dead in the middle of the pack. Behind them, Eric Stanford and uh, Ross Cato and uh, Gio Bramante and Shane Ewing round out the top 20. And uh, Ewing, one of those guys just out of the playoffs right now, so we'll keep monitor on that all night as well. It's a big run tonight to cement his place in the round of 12. Austin Coop begins tonight from 21st, joined on the outside of row 11 by the 22 of Bruce Pearson. Jason Cameron Jr. will start from 23rd. Joseph LaPlaca rolls off from 24th. He was the last driver to take time. Five drivers did not post a qualifying time. They are Brandon Bowie, Nelson Rivera, Sean Casto, AJ Browning, and Douglas Wyatt. And those drivers will begin 25th through 29th, respectively, here at Dover International Speedway, which is a one mile track with nine degrees of banking on the straightaways, 24 degrees in the turns. You go for a mile a lap, a mile a lap around this concrete speed drone and we'll go for 170 laps 170 miles your distance tonight remember no green white checkered here we will end a race under caution if a caution comes out that late if we go green here kyle any last bits and pieces that we should be watching for before we get the start of this race uh, I think patience is going to be a major factor in this one. Of course, 170 laps, a long distance uh, around the Monster Mile, so we'll uh, have to watch how patient these guys are at the start. And, of course, uh, the pit strategy could obviously play a factor as well in the end of this, and that could definitely play into advances to the next round of the playoffs over the coming weeks. We'll keep an eye on it. Happy to have you along with us at LSR TV for Race 28 of the 2017 season. Green flag is underway. I believe that was Sean Bounty in the 34 who did not get a good start. I saw that almost immediately. Spun the tires, coming to get the green flag, so he'll slide back a few spots. But at the front of the field, Shed will pace them into turn three. Then Jones, then Varinars, who gets stuck behind Washington. So. David Washington jumps up just ahead of one of his teammates. We know the alliance is pretty strong between the Aegis and the Powertech boys. And Washington will go up the third, Freenars to fourth, and then David Comstock to round out your top five. At mentioning that patience a moment ago, I think we're already seeing that. These guys getting single file in the early going here at the Monster Mile. And this is definitely one of those tracks that can bite you at any time. Uh, you know, they say that monster is out to get you. And a uh, place like this, James, kind of reminds me of Darlington. No, the wall's right there to grab you, and especially on the exit of the corner, uh, we could see that wall grab any of these guys at any time. Looks like a lot of single file action right now through the top ten with Shed and Jones out front as they roll back down to turn three. You almost have to go all the way back. 
Looks like Rod Flag and the 37 there of Gio Bromonti is your first side-by-side -side battle now. Eric Stanford getting involved in it, but everybody really stringing themselves out very quickly. We see this usually about 10 to 15 laps into most RSR races, but I think if we're seeing it now here on lap four, I think that speaks to just how much these guys respect this track and just how tricky they think tonight's going to be. Well, also, James, you know, looking at the uh, the grid right now, way back in 29, Shane Ewing, who comes in here three points out right now in the playoffs. He's already uh, 10 seconds back of the leader. And something else we'll have to keep watch on tonight that we didn't mention earlier was how quickly you can go a lap down uh, here at Dover. And I think that's something we'll definitely have to watch throughout the night. You can definitely uh, go minus one to the field quickly if you're not on top of your game right from the drop of the green flag. And that's something that these guys are going to have to keep monitor on as we're going to battle for the lead. I was about to say one guy who was on top of his game very, very quickly is the 11 of Dylan Jones, and he just went right underneath Carl Shedd as they came out of turn one, got the lead very easily, and David Washington followed right behind. So, move Dylan Jones up to P1, David Washington up to P2, Shedd will drop back to third. Uh, Shedd not really uh, pushing the issue there too, too early, sliding back in behind to take his time. Uh, as he tries to just settle in there, get some laps under his belt. Again, 170 laps here tonight at Dover. And uh, right now, top five cars pretty close to each other early in the race. These guys not really backing off that much in the early stages. But again, they are single file. Uh, James is the 42. Looks like he may have tagged the fence on this lap. Just overdrove it there last time by coming out of turn four. Tried to get to the gas a little bit too early. And you saw him smack the wall. I got a pretty good piece of it there with the side of his 42 machine. So we'll see if that damage affects David Comstock's race throughout the evening. What we can tell you, though, in the immediate short term is that Lionel Kalisto was able to clear him. So Comstock now back in the seventh spot, Kalisto up to sixth. And Daniel Everhart's come up a few places, too, currently running in the fifth spot, working the rear bumper now of Andrew Freenars pretty hard, trying to get the fourth position away. Yeah, he's going to actually use the top side to his advantage here down in turn number three. And uh, ooh, almost a little bit of contact there, but he's able to clear him up the outside. I'm interested to see how much of that we see here tonight, James, as well. How much is that top groove going to come in? Are you going to be able to uh, gain ground up there? Are you going to be able to make passes? Are you going to be able to hang on up there on a restart uh, towards the end of this race, which obviously could become a factor as uh, that field comes back out of turn number four here. Dylan Jones still out front. He's actually been able to open up a little bit of gap now over Washington already. Now 11 uh, laps up on the board. A one-mile track. This race is going to go by quickly for these guys. And was talking earlier about Shane Ewing. He was 10 seconds behind earlier. Now already 13 seconds back in threat already of going a lap down uh, in the early stages in a time he does not need to lose a lap. Really, really struggling as Ewing started 20th on the grid, already running last in the running order as they stared. So Ewing going to need to really find a way to pick up the pace. He'll be looking for adjustments, I think, almost immediately on that first pit stop. In the meantime, though, biggest battle here in the top five is definitely Daniel Everhart, who has cleared Kalisto and Friedars pretty quickly. And now, guess what? He's on the rear bumper of Carl Shedd trying to get the third position away. Yeah, Shed able to take off quickly at the start of the race, lead the uh, first couple laps there, but right now it looks like he is falling back a little bit back to third, and that car, uh, from what I can tell, James, maybe a little bit tight to the center of the corner. Uh, definitely going to be hunting some adjustments there as well, uh, but I think something we also need to keep monitor on, back around 14th, 15th position. These guys are racing hard right together, and uh, sometimes racing hard with each other may slow you up, and that's something we'll have to keep monitor on as well tonight. These guys racing each other side by side is allowing the cars behind them to close in the gap on them and have a uh, run of them for a position. There's space there, but there's not that much space amongst all of those drivers. So it's just another one of those things you'll have to watch out for. And as I slide back up into the field, nice move there by Seth DeMerchant to clear Sean Boundy and go take away the 11 spots so of DeMerchant coming up through the field just a little bit. But it's all pretty even for the most part, save for Everhart Shed and company but everybody's kind of spaced themselves out i think they all want to try and get a good long green flag running if they can yeah the early stages of the race running under the green flag i think beneficial to all of these drivers to not have to sit on pit row uh with a little bit of damage as they get going as they come down out of turn number four austin coop making a move they're able to slide around the 34 and uh coop parking his way up a little bit closer towards the front of the pack in that lsr tv machine 
Boundy starting to slide towards the back here. Not a good first run for him. Started in the eighth spot, is now minus five positions to 13th. So looks like the 34 is struggling a little bit for speed here. And we'll probably want to find a way to get some adjustments done on the next pit stop as Coop nearly loses the rear end of that car going to turn one. And see Coop running that middle to top groove uh, through the center. Of a little bit, well, really, the entrance of turn number one there. And not sure if he was, he mentioned it was a little bit loose. Now he's going to do it again down here in three and four. So experimenting with a little bit different of a line. It seemed to work uh, to get by the 34 boundary, but we'll see if it's able to work uh, to get by a couple more cars. I think the closer he gets to the front, it's going to be a little bit tougher to pass. These guys closer to the front uh, running a very quick pace. In the early stages here and Dylan Jones showing in his number 11 that he is able to open up a little bit of a gap on the rest of the field and see have a good car in the middle stage of this first one. Jones already clear of teammate David Washington by nine tenths of a second and Daniel Everhart has managed to get around Carl Shedd so Everhart now running in the third position and he's not too far behind Washington only a half second back of the number 98 so Everhart really your car on the move here i think throughout the whole of this field nobody's got more speed right now than the number 90 machine which i don't think should come as a surprise to a lot of people because he did win the spring race here in june after all yeah so uh, these guys coming down out of turn number two now back to the back straight away deep in the pack uh the 37 of uh, giovanni bramante trying to hang out of his uh, nelson rivera looks to the inside of him there they come out of turn two right there you see that Exit of that corner, that's going to be a factor all night. Rivera having to lift a little bit to not run into the 37. And uh, that bottom groove, especially on older tires when these guys are sliding around a little bit, going to be tougher to complete a pass down there in the bottom. And James, that's why I'm interested to see if this outside lane becomes a major factor in this race now that this is uh, already 21 laps in a very fast pace early set here tonight at the Monster Mile. Trouble now for Ross Cato here, trying to save the position and make sure that he doesn't get passed by Eric Stanford. But the 19 is able to roll that top side momentum very easily. So move him up one spot to the 18th spot. And I think you talked about it a few laps ago, Sousa, and I didn't quite believe that we were going to see it often. But we're seeing a lot of drivers, especially towards the back of the field, be willing to jump up off the bottom and see if they can make the middle and the top side work. Uh, Definitely a possibility here that we see these top lanes here come in a little bit earlier than normal. Yeah, and I don't know if that's going to be a factor closer to the front of the field. Seeing those guys at the front like Dylan Jones, uh, who continues to set the pace. He's running the bottom groove. So uh, the track rubbering in a little bit, getting hard, uh, harder to handle these cars around this one mile oval. And this is definitely one of those tracks, as we talked about, that can jump out and grab you. And right now... Dylan Jones continues to pull away. His car really looking hooked up in the early stages of this race. And uh, James, you know, nothing we've been doing now for 25 laps. How long can these guys make it on gas? We're going to be monitoring uh, green fight pit stops possibly here in this race, which is always a tough task at any track. But this one especially coming down off the banking in turn four and trying to get it down to pit road. The pit entrance is the key, and guess what? Daniel Everhart now up another spot. He's cleared David Washington for second, but the game has changed. The yellow flag comes out here on lap 25. It's our first caution of the race, and we'll get the replay up for you momentarily. <laughs> Hearing that it is Giovanni Bramante that has run into trouble, and... I get the sense that that was probably a result of the damage that he got a few laps ago there. And uh, as we look at the replay, ah, had to check up to avoid Ross Cato. And when he checked up to avoid Ross Cato, he just got stuck and didn't have anywhere to go. And into the inside retaining wall, he went, Kyle. Yeah, tough break for him right in the middle of the pack. Uh... We mentioned just trying to get some laps under his belt here tonight, but that's something that we're going to see, I think, a lot of here tonight. We're going to see yellows. We're going to see it right there, especially with those guys running nose to tail uh, back there in the middle of the pack. He just jammed on the brakes a little bit coming off turn four. Uh, they see the back end snap out from under him and into the inside wall he goes. So tough break for him as he's going to lose some laps on pit road trying to get that car fixed. And uh, I'm sure we're going to see some pit stops here in the first yellow flag of the night. Uh, we'll see plenty of them. Looks like everybody is in for tires and fuel. Dylan Jones leads them down. The biggest key here 
don't overshoot your pit stall. It's the easiest way to get burned in this sim. If you don't enter the pit box correctly and you have to reverse, that's an instant five or six positions at least, especially under yellow flag conditions. But it looks like a clean stop for everybody. We'll see if anybody decides to take two tires or do something funky. Not really. Should be pretty standard fare all the way through. Jones, first one off pit road. Then Daniel Eberhardt, David Washington, Carl Shedd, Major Freenars, and Lionel Callisto. So not too much change. Yeah, and uh, flat, right flag, electing to stay out here, James, on this early portion of this race 27 up on the leaderboard. Not sure if he stayed out there to try and lead a lap, or is he going to come in this time, or is he going to try and uh, stay out for the rest of the you know, the rest of the fuel run. Let's see as he comes off turn number four, see if he's able to duck the pit road. He is going to make his way, it looks like, down pit road. So that's going to hand the lean back over to Dylan Jones. And uh, Flag making an effort to possibly weed a lap there. Uh, looks to me like he may have got that done. Hearing that David Comstock took some extended time on pit road, I imagine that's probably to fix up the damage that he got when he smacked the wall very early on in this race. So I'm uh, going to be starting a little bit further back in this field, Will the 42 machine but uh, i think certainly has the pace to try and compete and contend for the race victory yeah, and that's something we'll have to keep uh definitely keep a watch on these guys coming from the middle and the back of the pack of course we mentioned uh that initial run possibly having somebody go a lap down we ran about 25 laps and saw nobody uh go a lap down there so keep monitor on that as well and uh, of course looking at those point standings all night uh, as these playoffs continue James Everhart coming in here, just three points to the good, and he's definitely shown early in this race that he's going to have a car to contend for the win. Uh, never mind, you know, get a good finish because of the points. It looks like he's going to definitely be a factor uh, when we go to decide the winner later on tonight. One of many factors, I think. Restart here, though, to come on lap 29. Jones will lead them down. Then, Everhart, Washington, Shed, Freenars, Kalisto, Silverwood, Flag, Vincent. Your top ten. All right, here we come back to the uh, green flag as they come off turn number four. And there it is, back in the air. Oh, bottom lane, third row there. We're going James. Not exactly sure who that was, but jump a little bit of a rough start for him as they come down in a turn. Well, this is another thing. These restarts, these guys are going to stack up with each other. It's going to be tough. And you're going to want to get as many cars passed as you can on a restart. But you also got to be careful not to put yourself in a little bit of uh, trouble as they roll down back out of turn four. So Andrew Farinars, who spun the tires on that last restart, he didn't really pay for it all that much, but the guys behind him, the Nick Silvers, the Seth DeMergence, Dwayne Vincents, who stacked up behind him, they're the ones that ended up really paying for the 88 because they didn't really have anywhere to go on this restart, so they get stepped up, and in the meantime, Dillick Jones still pacing everybody, making it happen out front. That looks like uh, first side by side battle we're going to see just inside the top 10 as they come back to turn number four and back to the line and put 31 up on the scoreboard. Gabe Wood on the outside able to come down and shut the door on Dwayne Vincent. Vincent's got a challenge now from Austin Coop on the top lane and Coop in that LSR TV machine working his way a little bit closer to the front of the pack now. Looks like he's going to complete the pass on Vincent and work his way into the top 10. That high side momentum, I think someone's going to jump up there and try it. And Coop might be the first one to really make it happen because he's got plenty of speed up there for the moment. The question is who decides to go up there and block him and take away his line. Looks like Gabe Wood tried to do it for a little bit, but Coop's got a lot of speed. I don't know how much longer that double zero is going to be able to hang on unless Coop burns off the tires. And something deeper behind them, I think we're I'm kind of surprised, James. I don't know about you. I'm surprised that outside lane being utilized so much. Here in the early stages, a little bit behind them. Ross Cato trying to hang on in the bottom, though, uh, in his number 12, uh, back up front. You keep monitor on that. Dylan Jones able to get back out front in his number 11 from the bottom on that restart. Take back the lead. Uh, Washington, though, able to take second. Everhart now back to third. And early leader Carl Shedd in fourth. So the pit stop's not a problem for the front couple of guys. And it looks like they've still got the speed to be able to hang on at the front of the pack. Also seeing a little bit of nose damage from the number 90 of Daniel Everhart. Not quite sure where he got that from. But I wonder if one of these restarts might be the answer to that question. But be curious to see how that affects the way that 90 car handles. Not necessarily worried about the speed, but handling. That tightens up the car a little bit. That could be a factor going on in this race. 
And I think something else I've been seeing is scanning throughout the field in the early stages of this race. It's very easy to come up off that corner a little bit too hard and hit the outside wall. And uh, we've seen a couple of guys already get some damage from that. And the damage you get early in the race sometimes can dictate how the rest of the race goes. And that's something as well that we're seeing already, uh, especially towards the middle of the pack with these guys racing so hard with each other. A little bit closer to the front, Seth the Merchant trying to hang on as uh, he and Nick Silver going at it there down into turn three. Pretty good battle there. And you've got a lot of drivers that are just kind of stacked up there. Especially if you get a little bit further back, you've got Trevor Rompolo, Corey Wolf, Sean Boundy, Ross Cato, Sean Casto, and David Comstock all right there together. And maybe with it about eight car lengths space tops. So not a lot of breathing room there. Looks like we're going to have a little bit of a battle. Corey Wolf trying to go underneath Trevor Rompolo to get 13th away. Yeah, they come off turn four. These guys sit. There you go. Coming off that exit of the corner. Who's going to decide that they want to step in the gas a little bit harder than the guy they're competing against and it looks like wolf able to do it here to pick up the position but again that stack up effect starting to happen just behind them uh bounding that number 34 looking to the bottom looking to the top trying to find a different lane but these guys have got to be careful with a couple more cars right on their tail you got to be careful switching lanes to try and get positions away as they come back off turn number four and uh, just behind them sean castro trying to watch it all to see what happens in front of him yeah, that's the big battle here. You've got Boundy and then Comstock trying to lead his charge back towards the front after getting that damage via the wall clip there very early on in the race. Was top 10 at the time, currently down in 16th, trying to rebound. Then you've got Sean Castro trying to run past Ross Cato, who slides back another position, and Eric Stanford all right in there in that battle. And then <clears throat> one of the many drivers here that already on the page and already making note of breast cancer awareness month a lot of pink in this field now i think always a good thing to see all the support for breast cancer awareness breast cancer research during the month of october and it looks like even though we're only two days into the month that real simracing.com full throttle cup series is no exception to that a lot and a lot and a lot of pink out here on the track tonight yeah definitely something uh, of course all of us are happy to see out there and uh probably see a lot of that this month uh, which is a great thing for the drivers to be doing that watching that battle still there in the middle of the pack between 15th and 18th those guys racing really hard for position here on lap 42 and taking a look at those playoff standings sean castro uh in that number 46 right now running 17th he came in here about five six seven points away from that cutoff position so he's trying to work his way a little bit closer to the front i know it's still early but the lap's clicking off pretty quickly james 43 already up on the board and uh, they're gonna go by quickly as just in front of him right now they go side by side with the 34 trying to work that outside lane but uh, bunny not having much luck with it right now not too much luck is sean boundy having there running the top side and castle in particular He's got to find a way to go. He's got to beat Ross Cato by 10 or 11 spots, depending on the tiebreaker. I'm not necessarily certain how close it would be on tiebreakers there, but Casto needs positions and he needs to beat Cato bad if he wants a spot in the round of 12. He's got to make things happen and move. A little bit closer to the front, James, as we continue to monitor that battle in the middle of the pack, that battle for second heating up as Everhart in that number 90 and uh, Washington in that 98 going out there. They're about a second back, though, of Dylan Jones and James Early. 46 laps up on the board. I know we've still got a long way to go here. Uh, my math tells me 129 laps still left to go up on the leaderboard. But Jones, Everhart, and Washington seem to be the three best cars. They take off pretty well, and they have decent speed on a longer run behind them. Carl Shedd, who uh, obviously had some speed being the pole setter here tonight, his longer run speed, they're going to have to work on that car to get it a little bit better if he wants to get up there and challenge the likes of Jones and Everhart. Everhart pulling a little bit now away from Washington in that battle for second. When I talk about a guy who can come in and be a short track specialist, that's what Daniel Everhart's done oh so well all season. All of his victories have come at tracks that are either a mile in length or shorter. And this happens to be just on the top end of that sequence. He's looking for the Dover sweep and also looking to separate himself from everybody else in the playoffs. 
because he is technically speaking the last man in the bubble sitting in that 12th position in points but a run like this would lock him in very easily into the round of 12 though I know he'd want the playoff point and the win that would go with that if he can make that happen uh, there's no better way to lock yourself into the next round than win. You don't have to have any stress. And uh, he's trying to do that tonight, as are guys like Cato and Kalisto. Uh, Kalisto monitoring him. He's still running inside the top five in his 97. So a great run in the early stages for him. And, of course, you're mentioning Ebra Hart in that number 90 running second. And he and Dylan Jones, the race leader, running some... Pretty close lap times to each other right now. See if Everhart can close in the gap. They've made some adjustments. Got four new fresh tires on that caution just a little bit ago. And uh, now 50 on the board. 100 and 20 laps remaining here tonight at the Monster Mile. And uh, these guys keeping each other pretty close towards the middle of the pack. Up front, they're a little bit stretched out. But that battle uh, back around 10th, 11th with... Uh, the one and Wolf and the 16, those guys starting to go at it a little bit. That's about the first side-by-side -side battle and the closest battle inside the top 15. The closest battle, but I think this all really starts here. I would drag everybody from Nick Silver on back into it. So you got Silver, Vincent, Gabe Woods there. The side-by-side -side battle of Tallarico and Wolf that you just mentioned. And then a little bit further back, Rapolo's there. And then Comstock and Casto both trying to make their way up through the field. And then three-car battle here with Bounty, Cato, and Rivera for 16th, 17th, 18th, and then another yellow flag to change everything. Joseph LaPlaca going to bring out the second caution of the evening. Replay will come up momentarily. Kyle, did you see anything that happened there to bring out the yellow from LaPlaca in particular? Uh, looked to me like he, no, I didn't see it till he came down and hit the inside wall, so I have to see exactly what happened there. Looks to me like he may have just lost control in the middle of the straightaway and uh, slid down to the inside of the track, bounced off that inside wall. It looks like a decent amount of damage on that number of 58. He's going to be sitting on pit road for a bit to get that car fixed up if he wants to continue here tonight. Looked like one of those classic cases, as we mentioned in pre-race, of just trying to get on the gas a little bit too early here, and that is about the most deadly of decisions that you can make at Dover if you get on it too early especially coming out of turn two onto the back straightaway. There's no room for error. You're going to hit the inside retaining wall, and that's just exactly what Joseph LaPlaca did right there. In the meantime, though, we've got more traffic on pit road. Jones will lead them all down. It looks like everybody is going to come down here. No one going to try and gamble and stay out this time around. But will we see gambles on pit road, Kyle? Maybe uh, someone I take two tires, perhaps. I think it's going to be tough for these guys to take two tires. We, you know, My math here, we put up 20, 30 laps on that set of tires. Again, I think we're more likely to see that after 5, 10, 12 laps on a set of tires. But right now, these guys coming in and taking four is probably going to be of their best benefit. Dylan Jones back on pit road in his number 11. Of course, been leading this race since the early stages when he took the lead from Carl Shedd. And he continues to lead, and uh, the pit stops, James, as we've been talking about all night, as they hustle off pit road. Looks like Jones and the 11 going to beat the rest of the challengers off pit road as they come across the stripe this time by under the caution flag. Jones coming out first, Washington second, and Everhart third. And uh, Everhart and Washington trading that second spot back and forth a couple of times now. And it looks like they've done it once again on pit road. That just goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth between those two, doesn't it? So, Yeah, that's something uh, that's going to be a major factor in the restart. And we haven't really talked a lot about the restarts yet. This is going to be the third one of the night. Which lane, James, do you think is going to be better on these restarts? I think the bottom has shown to be great at the front of the pack, but I'm wondering if that outside lane is going to be a factor on one of these restarts at some point. Well, to be honest, I don't necessarily know if I've got the statistical data that would prove which lane would be best, but I know that those on the sim who use Joel Real Timing probably would have that data, which gives us a chance to remind you that coverage of tonight's broadcast of the RealSimRacing.com Full Throttle Cup Series is brought to you by Joel Real Timing, the official timing software of LSR TV. Whether you spend your time on the sim, behind the wheel, on the pit box, or from the spotter stand, JRT is the go-to software for iRacing timing and scoring analytics. You can get yourself a basic download for free or get the pro version today when you visit joel-real-timing.com. 
proud partners of LSR TV's broadcast are JRT. And uh, it makes me wonder if anybody here at the front of the field really does know which one of those two lanes is the best one. I'd be inclined to say the outside because we've seen some drivers spin the tires on that inside lane, especially from about second or third. And it's caused drivers to stack up behind them. So I almost wonder if the bigger question, Kyle, is whether or not we're going to see someone miss a shift or spin the tires on this restart and cause more chaos back in the middle of the pack. Yeah, I think it's uh, very easy for, well, not easy, but it's possible for somebody to miss a shift, spin a tire, and collect five, six, seven cars in a crash at a restart at any given time, uh, really. So we're going to have to keep watch on that as the field comes back across the our finish line, doubling up now as we get sent to bed, go back under the, 50, uh, the green flag. 56 laps on the scoreboard of the 170 in tonight's event. Dylan Jones leading David Washington and Daniel Eberhardt. Those are the top three. Uh, Carl Shedd and Kalisto right now are rounding out the top five. And those guys been at the front for the whole race. We haven't really seen somebody work from all the way in the back of the pack and get themselves up to the front yet, James. There's a couple of guys that have worked their way a little bit closer to the front. Uh, one of those being Seth DeMerchant. He's up to the seventh spot in that number 30, uh, number 57, excuse me. So we'll see if he can uh, make a move to the front on this restart and try and get himself a couple of positions. DeMerchant's been a big charger, as has Sean Castor, who started 27th, didn't take a qualifying time, now up to the 14th spot. DeMerchant started in 14th, now up to 7th. So two guys who are really making moves through the field and Castor in particular needs it if he wants any sort of chance to make the round of 12. Clean restart though for everybody it looks like. Not too many issues anywhere through the field so Jones will jump out ahead looks like Everhart might be able to clear Washington as they come through turn two Kalisto will slide into the third spot then you've got Shed fourth, Greenhorn's fifth and Demerchant now up to sixth Looks like he got around Nick Silver there and is going to try and jump up towards the top of the field even more. Uh, James, something that's really amazing me uh, here in the first 58 laps now of this race is Dylan Jones' ability to get out front and have two or three car lengths after the first uh, lap back around after a restart. That number 11 has shown to be dominant in the early stages of this race. And a late restart, I think right now with what we have seen, it would be really, really hard to bend against Dylan Jones. We have not seen him though, James, and I'm not sure if we will or not. Of course, with the pit strategy, uh, under the cautions and under the green, we have not seen Jones really be challenged in this race so far. And I wonder if any of these guys have been hanging on and saving something as they try to get a little bit closer to him. Well, I think you've got time. That's the biggest key here. You don't necessarily have to press the issue so much. You've got over 100 laps to work with, and I think for a lot of these guys, the key is going to be making sure that you have a car to fight at the end of this race with and make sure that it's not totally dinged up. You saw what happened to David Comstock very early on in this race. He had a top five car, and then he clipped the wall out of turn four, and he's currently mired back in the 15th position. So if, if you get the outside of the wall here on corner exit just by trying to get on the throttle a little bit too early, it can not only kill your car, it can kill your race too. And at this stage, when you're not really racing for much of anything, that's about the last thing that you need to happen. Absolutely, and uh, damage, not something you need at all. As they come back onto turn number four, Coop still out front, that battle for second and even third this time. Looking like it may start to heat up. James Kalisto making a little bit more of a move on this restart. And now as he's trying to get up a couple positions, but Jones again, three tenths of a second up at the front of the pack. And then, as we mentioned on the last restart, the battle in the middle of the pack is the one that's been the closest all evening long so far as we close in on 100 laps to go. These guys starting to battle once again, just outside that top 10 position with guys like Sean Castro, who need to come in here and have a good run to get in the next round of the playoffs here in this series. And then another guy, James, we had mentioned really, really early in the race that could have going a lap down, that's kind of working his way closer to the front is Shane Ewing. Remember, he was back 26, 27. He's just inside the top 20 now. So it looks like they're getting that car a little bit better. And he's creeping his way towards the middle of the pack. Ever so slightly when you need it most. I think that's the biggest key. We just have to see whether or not he can get high enough up in this field to really make a difference in this points battle. I'll slide a little bit further back, though, in the field here. Pretty tight battle between Carl Shedd, Andrew Farinars, and Seth Demerchant, who's done a really nice job coming up through this field. 
but a lot of pressure now from the 88 trying to get the rear bumper of the 45 loosened up just enough to get a hole underneath him because Shed's been consistent but not necessarily as fast as either of the two drivers behind them so this could be a nice little battle pack here within the next five to ten laps yeah the merchant's really been able to cut his way through the pack i've been watching him a little bit slice through the, some of the traffic and uh, of course right now on top of these two guys trying to get a little bit better bro we mentioned him just before that restart back outside the top 10 a little bit earlier and he's definitely one of those guys james has been experimenting with that second groove and i think uh we're seeing a lot more cars experiment with that second groove now so this is something we should keep watching as the race goes along how much is that outside groove really going to be a factor in the late stages it looks like after five or six laps they're able to use that top lane uh but for, i don't know about you but from what i can see on a restart james that bottom lane especially towards the front seems to be able to get a little bit better takeoff uh, and then as the longer we go, the merchant, these guys starting to work that top lane in a little bit more and see if they can get that all crucial drive off the corner to drive up alongside the guy in front of them. Yeah, I think the widening of the groove and the way this plays out over the course of a green flag run, all very, very big things to note here. I think you've absolutely hit it right on that uh, you'd like to be on the bottom for the restarts if you can. But being up top isn't necessarily the worst thing in the world if you go up there and you end up in a pretty good position. Yeah, top lane is going to be uh, something we'll keep monitoring on all night. And uh, looking back at the front of the pack, James, I know that battle going on between Kalisto and the Merchant and those guys, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, but a little bit closer to the front. I think this is the closest we've seen uh, the 90 of Everhart be able to stay a little bit closer to Jones this time across the line. Again, a little under half a second, that distance between the top two. Everhart seeming to make a couple of adjustments in that car that's closed him up to Jones a little bit as they come back to the back straightaway. He's working. He's working. He's trying. He's got speed. Daniel Everhart's definitely got a very, very healthy amount of pace in that 90 machine, and he just hasn't had the track position throughout a good chunk of this race up to this point to really get up there and try and run and make a difference in this event. But now I think he's in a position where he can make things happen, where he's got a car that can run up there and can do something special. And now that he's got him kind of hanging out there like the proverbial carrot that Kyle Busch spoke about post-race yesterday in the cup race, I'd be very curious to see what Everhart does here over these next 15 laps. Everhart definitely a little bit quicker the last couple of laps compared to those of Dylan Jones. For example, that last time by Jones running a 23-3, Everhart a 23-2, so a little bit less than a tenth of a second between those top two drivers. But Everhart definitely visibly this time now closing that gap as he comes back down the front straightaway. And uh, something we are watching as well. James just back to that battle inside, just inside the top five. Kalisto able to run away from Shed, but Shed still got some heavy pressure behind him. A little bit less pressure now, but those guys still watching him and then scanning back a little bit further in the pack. Their single file spread out using both the bottom and the top lanes. I think this is great. A lot of different lanes being used and a lot of the guys running the bottom, a lot running the top and some running the middle. Uh, but I think I've talked about it a lot tonight, and I'm seeing it a little bit closer to the front of the pack with guys like Jones and Everhart. That all crucial drive off the corner, the way you set yourself up to not spin those rear tires on exit is what's keeping these guys at the front. And uh, now 75 laps complete. We're under 100 laps to go. I know we mentioned this is a longer race, uh, 170 laps, but it is going by rather quickly, and uh, we're going to be in the final stages before long. I was about to say, not too long before we hit lap 85 and we have to crack out the iRacing Midway race break. So, a pretty good space, though, between these front few drivers as of now. Everhart's kind of held at a steady gap of about four tenths of a second to Jones, and then it's another seven tenths of a second back to David Washington, and another second about back to Kalisto. And I think the pressure's come off of Shed a little bit. He managed to hold off Freenars and Looks like the 88 might be cooling off the tires as we get towards the middle of this run. And if you're looking for a legitimately furious battle, probably have to go back to Dwayne Vincent in the ninth position. He's got Gabe Wood right on his rear bumper and then maybe five car lengths back. You've got Corey Wolf and Tanner Tallarico that are racing pretty hard as well up there all the way on the top side of the racetrack. 
as they come back off return number two Tallarico making a good run off that corner I think that outside lane actually giving them a pretty decent run coming off the corners all that grip on that top lane that may not be there going in and through the middle when you step in the gas if you're able to stay in it that outside lane with the big run kind of reminds you of a mile and a half track James I know this is shorter track but a track will we may see like Charlotte coming up in the next couple of weeks when they're running that outside lane and they're able to match the throttle. They may get a run as Tallarico takes a look to the inside. That battle just outside the top 10 uh, here tonight at Dover and Tallarico looking like he may make some ground now on the bottom group. Pretty good speed there for Tallarico, but Wolf was able to really roll the exit out of four and get some momentum to get there. Can he keep it up on the high side for the moment? Yes, he can. I wonder, though, because Tallarico looks like he's getting into the corner really, really well. Might be able to hang on to that spot just about here, unless Wolf gets a really, really good run off the corner like he just did. So move Corey Wolf for certain into that 11th position. Yeah, and Wolf able to use that top plane to his advantage. I mentioned that drive off behind them. Castro trying to walk to the inside of Tallarico. Those guys going at it. 11th, 12th, and 13th. The battle there. Tallarico almost getting into the back. And Wolf has to lift a little bit through the middle of turn number four. James, I don't want to shy away from that battle going on just outside the top 10. But if you look close at the front, Dylan Jones has his first challenge of the night, his first significant challenge, that is, as we cross at lap number 81. He's got a challenge from Eberhardt, who is now within a car length of him, back off of turn number four. These guys a second and a half ahead of Washington, Kalisto, and Shed right now, the top five. But that battle for the lead definitely heating it up, and Eberhardt flexing his muscles close to the front now as he looks to the inside off turn two. First real battle for the lead all evening long. Daniel Everhart down to the bottom. Dylan Jones up top, but I don't think Jones is even going to press the issue. So Everhart will clear Jones very easily, and Daniel Everhart will go to the race lead here on lap 83. Approaching the halfway point, and Everhart showing that he is going to be a factor. Takes the lead away from Jones. Jones able to settle right into second, though. Get back behind them, see exactly where Everhart is beating him around this one mile oval. And James, I think for the first time tonight, very shortly here, we're gonna see some lack traffic possibly be a factor here tonight at the Monster Mile. These guys heading back towards, excuse me, turn number one. Bruce Pearson uh, back there, he's the last car in the lead lap. He's got about half to three quarters of a straightaway before he's in threat of going a lap down, but those leaders running lap times much quicker than him right now. We have not seen lap traffic be a factor, but I wonder if that's going to close up the front and the other guy that's starting to close a little bit, James David Washington, running in third. When those two got going in the battle for the race lead, Washington able to close a couple of tenths of a second. And, uh, you know, we mentioned those lines a little bit earlier, James. The top three cars running right around that bottom groove, mostly around this racetrack. I wonder if the speed is really down there and those guys in the middle of the pack struggling a little bit with the handling. Something we'll have to keep watch on as we hit the halfway point here tonight. I think for the best handling cars, if you can get down to the bottom, that's where you want to be. And we've seen some of these drivers run the top side, but as workable as your high groove is here at Dover, I really do think the bottom, if you can run it, is where you're going to run the absolute fastest lap times. But we have crossed the halfway point of tonight's race, so it is now time to bring you our iRacing Midway Race Break, which is brought to you by iRacing, the leading online racing simulation. Developed from the beginning as a centralized racing and competition service, iRacing organizes, hosts, and officiates races on virtual tracks all around the world. In the fast-paced world of esports, iRacing is a one-stop shop for all kinds of online racing. With officially sanctioned racing from NASCAR, IndyCar, IMSA, the World of Outlaws, the Cars Tour, Blancpain GT, the VLN Endurance Championship, USAC V8 Supercars, and more. Daniel Everhart, your leader here as we work lap 88. Dylan Jones currently in second. David Washington back behind those two by about a second. He's in third. Lionel Kalisto, 2.8 seconds behind the leader in fourth. Carl Shedd right there behind Kalisto in the fifth spot. Andrew Farinars runs in sixth. Seth DeMerchant in the seventh position at the moment, followed by Nick Silver in eighth. Dwayne Vincent and Gabe Wood currently run in the ninth and tenth places. Just outside the top 10, Corey Wolf will be looking at that battle with him. David Comstock right there with him as well. Tanner Tolarico, 13th. 
Sean Castro is 15th, just after the halfway point here at Dover and Roscato. Running back in 15th, Trevor Rapolo 16th, Nelson Rivera 17th, Brandon Brewey, uh, Eric Stanford, and Austin Coop running out the top 20, James, as the field comes back off of turn number two and back to the back straightaway with 90 now up on the board. Running in the 21st position is Shane Ewing. He'll need to make something happen in the second half of this race if he wants to survive elimination. He's in 21st at the moment. Sean Bounty currently in 22nd. 23rd is Jason Cameron Jr. Last car running on track is Bruce Pearson in 24th. 25th is Douglas Wyatt. He's 15 laps down. All these other cars out of the race. A.J. Browning, Joseph LaPlaca, Rod Flagg, and Giovanni Bramante all run 26th through 29th on the leaderboard. And that has been your iRacing Midway Race Break. For more information on the wide variety of sim racing possibilities online, visit iRacing.com to sign up today. For a limited time, you can visit iRacing.com forward slash World of Outlaws and take advantage of exclusive promotion codes to get yourself on the sim with a one-year membership for half the price if you visit iRacing.com forward slash World of Outlaws. Back here at Dover on lap 93 of 170, and Daniel Everhart has managed to gap Dylan Jones just a little bit. It's now up over half a second, and as they cross the stripe this time by, it's now up over six tenths. So he's not faster by much, but Daniel Everhart is definitely beginning to put Dylan Jones further and further in his rearview mirror. Hey, no, James, I'm just looking now as the field hits back down into turn over three. Eberhardt's number 90. You mentioned earlier you had a little bit of front end damage. He does still have that front end damage on his Ford Fusion, but doesn't seem to be affecting him as his top couple of guys have been able to gap the rest of the field. Eberhardt and Jones, and then Washington third. Carl Shedd able to slide back around. He's back up to the fourth position after winning, starting on the pole earlier and winning the pole award. Uh, that's your top four. We've been watching that battle just outside the top ten between Wolf. Bellarico, Castro, and Cato. That continuing, that's definitely the closest group of cars on the track as we're already close to lap 100 now. Then and I'd say now, James, we're getting into the final stages of this race. If you've got something, you've got to show it. And guys like Daniel Everhart, who came in here close in the championship, are showing it. I'd say Kalisto, pretty close, coming in here 10th as well. He's showing he can be towards the front. But guys like Shane Ewing, right now Ewing running back in 22nd. He's got to pick up positions quickly because this race is starting to wind down. It's not a great look for you again. All he has to do is beat Ross Cato by, I believe, it's six positions. And he would have a place here in the round of 12. But it's not happening yet. And you look at the guys that are closer to the bubble. Everhart's running top five. Kalisto's running top ten. Everhart's leading, rather. Let's go ahead and call a spade a spade there. But Kalisto's having a good day. Everhart's having a good day. Even Trevor Rapala, not necessarily having the worst of days in 16th. It's not great, but it's enough. Kind of like Ricky Stenhouse Jr.'s day yesterday. It wasn't a great day by any standard, but it was enough to carry him into the round of 12. And sometimes you just kind of have to take that and roll with it. And if that's the best you can get, if that gets you into the next round of the playoffs, so be it. Because we'll go to a whole new track next week in Charlotte, and the playoffs will be reset, and it just won't even matter that much. Yeah, James, I think you mentioned a second ago getting what you can out of the car. If you try to get too much out of the car at a place like Dover that we're at here tonight, it can bite you. We've seen a couple of cars slide off the corner and end up in the inside wall, one on the front stretch, one in the back stretch. Uh, we're mentioning uh, Rapolo there a moment ago. He's got Ross Cato. He's going to go by Cato now for the 15th position as they come back off of turn number four. Uh, but these guys starting to take the positions that they think they may have in the final stages of this race, you've got to be a little bit closer to the field on a restart if you're going to have a chance at winning the race. But you mentioned uh, these guys finishing where they can with their car. They don't want to wreck the car and, to, you know, to get one or two more positions. You mentioned lap traffic a little bit earlier. It has officially come into play because Daniel Everhart has caught the number 22 of Bruce Pearson. And now you see Dylan Jones working over the 22 and clearing him pretty easily. So, Everhart still leading Jones there second and then Washington in third. And I imagine that's only going to be a little bit trickier as they go forward. 
And middle of the pack there, James Tellerico going at it with Wolf and Castro. Those guys are having an intense battle with 102 laps complete. Uh, now 68 laps to go, if my math is correct. So Castro all over the back bumper with Tellerico. Those guys just outside the top 10. 13th and 14th, just in front of them. We mentioned Corey Wolf in that number 16. He's trying to hang on from those guys further up. Gabe Wood is pulled away from these guys. And uh, whoa, Wolf a little bit loose off turn number four. Back in slides out from underneath him, able to hang on. But Tellerico trying that top lane now out of turn two. These guys trying to find what lane is going to be best for them to get around each other. And this definitely the closest battle on the track in the second half so far. Castro's really got to make something happen here. He needs to be clear of Ross Cato by 11 for certain to make it into the round of 12. He's only clear of Ross Cato by two positions. So the 46 has really got to start finding a way to get up there. Now back to back straight away they come and uh, Castro coming in here, James, as you mentioned him coming in here, multiple points out 15th in the playoff standings. He's got to make some ground up quickly as we've hit the second half of this race down to just 65 laps to go when they come around this time by. So uh, he's got to get going a little bit closer to the front, as does a guy like Shane Ewing, who came in here just a few points out. Ewing, the first guy out, three points back. But James, do not look now. He is the next car that the leaders will catch to put a lap down. Right now, the last car on the lead lap, I know he could use a caution flag uh, to get him a little bit better with his adjustments on that car. Speaking of adjustments, here we go. The dice have been rolled. Sean Castro is coming down pit road right now. So he will hope here that this race goes green for the rest of the way. I imagine he can make it on fuel and it's just going to try and take advantage of the track position here to get four fresh tires on and get this car back out on track. But this is the move that I think he had to make in order to have any shot of being in the round of 12 and gaining the track position he needed because the car just doesn't have the speed. It would take a pit call like this to make things happen, and that's brought a few more drivers down pit road as well in the form of Trevor Rapolo and Ross Cato. So all of these drivers, all in the playoffs, all responding to what the number 46 has just done. Field coming back across the stripe. James, we were looking earlier at that battle for the lead. Everhart able to take it away, and he's got Jones by a big margin. I think a little bit surprised about that, but now battle for a second. Dave Washington to the bottom lane. He's going to take that second spot away, looks like now, from Dylan Jones. So a great run by him. All of a sudden, Washington has become a car that has gone by Jones as well. So Jones, I wonder how long he's going to stay out here on the track without pinning, down to just 60 laps to go when they come back by. He's got to make an adjustment. Seems like when the track is rubbered up, Jones's car has gone away, especially on a long run. And he's under fire now again as Carl Shedd is closing in on him and what will be a battle for third. Pretty ugly, pretty quick. Jones, you see the fall off being very, very, very painful and just ever more slightly obvious with each passing laugh. The 11 is fading. How much longer does he stay out here and lose time to these leaders? And when does he come in to get his final set with four fresh Goodyear tires? Big questions here atop the pit box for the 11 machine, and we will see how the folks at Aegis Motorsports handle it. Back across the line, that battle for a second now continuing as Washington and Shed going on there down the back straightaway. That's the battle there. Shed now making a late run. That long, long run seems to be in his favor. Of course, he was really quick winning the pole earlier on run lap speed. Seems to be really quick on a long run. This run now, James, definitely going over 50 laps as they come back down towards turn one. Shed with a look to the bottom lane. Washington gives him the room on the top, and they will exit turn two with Shed using that bottom groove and the grip to take over that second position down the back straightaway both of those but you see the difference in fresh tires here right before your eyes look at how sean casto has just blown by the race leaders and come through them almost like he got shot out of a cannon coming out the back straight away and down into turn three so you can see the difference that fresh tires and speed does for you does that convince any of the drivers at the front of the field to try and make that piss up a little bit earlier knowing the difference in speed that you can get your tires are fresh and as soon as i say that there's your answer daniel eberhardt race leader now down to pit road eberhardt making his way to pit road one guy i'm surprised has not pitted yet james is dylan jones now back to fifth just before eberhardt decided to come to pit road that number 11 has definitely fallen off and you see a couple cars 
driving right by him at a high rate of speed after coming in for a set of tires. Looks like Washington's going to come in a little bit loose, getting on the apron there. Oh, man, Washington down on that apron, almost loses control. I had mentioned earlier about how difficult it would be to get on pit road here in Washington. Almost losing control of his number 98. He's going to be able to make it to pit road, luckily for him. But a close call there on a guy that was running inside the top three. I thought that was interesting because he came down to the apron exiting turn three, trying to make his entrance a little bit easier. And in the process, he slid up the racetrack and nearly cleaned out a few cars behind him in the process. So Washington survives just by the edge of his seat. As you see the replay of what happened on your screen. And now it will be incumbent upon Carl Shedd to bring his number 45 down for service. He's next in line amongst the leaders. Still has yet to pit. We'll see if that changes this time. And it looks like it will. Shedd brings his car down. And Andrew Farinars will bring his car down as well, as will Dylan Jones. So I think that now means Wayne Vincent will be the race leader when they come around this next time by. No, James, something we were talking about earlier, a little bit of strategy to maybe get you into the next round. Well, one guy we're watching with that, doing that strategy right now is Shane Ewing, who's been running outside the top 15 all night, staying out as long as he can to try and get a caution flag as this race gets down towards the final stages. Of course, we're down now close to 50 laps to go in this race. That's going to go by quickly. Ewing obviously knowing he cannot make it to the end on a tank of fuel, but he's going to try and hope for a caution flag. Right now, he's pushed himself all the way up inside the top five. Dwayne Vincent now showing the way under this most recent set of green flag pit stop cycles as guys like Carl Shedd work their way on and off pit road. 117 laps to go. And we've got a caution. James, big, sure big there. yellow that will change the complexion of this race completely. Corey Wolf in the 16 with problems here. And man, if you didn't come down to pit road yet, if you're Shane Ewing, what kind of happy dance are you doing in your seat? How huge is that for the driver of the number 32? Uh, how huge is that for him? I had just mentioned he was taking a chance staying out that long. And boy, is that chance going to uh, work out for him as we'll get a replay on what happened to Wolf in the number 16. Uh, I'm not sure if he had pitted or not, James. I can't remember us calling his name, but it looked like some contact there with he and Stanford in the 19. Wolf coming up on the exit of turn four. Definitely some contact there, and those two going spinning on the front straightaway and forming the caution with about 50 laps to go here tonight. Yeah, I think Wolf just thought he was a little bit clearer than he actually was, and Stanford was right there, and they contacted and both went into the outside retaining wall first and then came back down into the inside retaining wall and Wolf has already claimed responsibility for that yellow so indeed he did think he was clear and just was not but this changes absolutely everything for the very few drivers that were up there at the front of the field Dwayne Vincent Shane Ewing the last few drivers that had yet to come down for four tires and fuel trapping a lot of people a lap down and if you're sean casto that was absolutely the last thing you wanted to see well james a couple guys that were still on the wing lap are on pit road now joey vincent who is the leader and shane ewing coming down both of them dropping and heading out not really in any rush because they were the only two cars looks like that remained on the wing lap during that cycle of course everybody else now probably going to take that wave around to get back on the lead lap but of course the guys that pitted a little bit earlier we had talked about trying to get a short pit advantage it looks like seth the merchant has been able to get around a couple of these other guys that he had been behind a little bit earlier so he'll be a little bit closer to the front and dylan jones who's been stuck back a little bit deeper in the field he had led a lot of this race in the early stages looks like he's going to be outside the top five now for this restart He's got good speed on a short run, but maybe they've worked on that car a little bit to get him a little bit better on a long run. Uh, this just changes so, so much, and I imagine we'll see a lot of resetting and shuffling amongst the leaderboard here. So while our leaderboard tries to get itself reset under this caution, we'll take a moment to remind you. Coming back across the strike at lap number 120. Down to 50 laps to go here tonight. Let's see as the uh, running order comes across the stripe. Who is going to be where when we get set for this restart, James? 50 laps to go here tonight. We've seen a great battle up at the front between Everhart 
and Jones. But uh, right now, Eberhardt's going to be stuck. Not as the leader. We're going to have a couple newer drivers to these restarts at the front. This is that time where they got to get most of these positions on a restart. In the meantime, though, we'll take a moment to remind you that coverage of the RealSimRacing.com Full Throttle Cup Series is brought to you by Hippie's Paint Shop. Hippie's Paint Shop has over five years of experience providing top quality custom paint schemes for all iRacing vehicles at a low price. Because after all, at Hippie's Paint Shop, the cost isn't high, just the painter. Uh, Long-standing partners of the likes of Doug Roth and Douglas Wyatt and company, so... Uh, not too much of their product on show tonight, but tune in each week here within the Full Throttle Cup Series. You're going to see at least a few handfuls of paid schemes there from the folks at HPS. And you can like them on Facebook as well if you want to see more of their work. In the meantime, though, it looks like we've got most of the field reset to some degree. Uh, though I think we're still trying to sort through this and figure out who is where under yellow. You've got Eberhardt there leading this field, leading the pack, trying to figure out everything. And just kind of, I think, sitting there and not doing much of anything. Kind of taking the easy Sunday drive, which I think now he can do he's got the track position it's it's been easy <clears throat> not all that complicated for him now that he has managed to clear the alliance teammate i suppose dwayne vincent and now we're now we'll really see this start to work here a lot of these drivers are going to take the wave around to get back into proper position and once they do that should clear everything up and bring us back to the grid order that we will need here for the restart, which will come on lap 123. Dwayne Vincent, Shane Ewing, and how about Bruce Pearson, who was a lap down not to... <coughs> Bruce Pearson was a lap down not too long ago. He's now in the third position, which I think says everything about how weirdly and yet perfectly that caution came out for some of these guys. So now that you've got the track position, if you're Dwayne Vincent, if you're Shane Ewing, what can you do, Kyle, with this track position and how well can you manage it here for the last 50 laps, especially for Ewing to try and fight your way into the round of 12? Well, I'm not sure what Ewing uh, has got to stay at the front of the pack, James. We mentioned him almost going a lap down over the last couple of uh, green flag runs, so I'm not really sure what he has. Does he have anything? A run at the front of the pack. We're going to find out here pretty quickly. And if he doesn't, how quickly are these guys able to get around him? And does it box somebody in? Uh, based on looking at the order, it looks like Eberhardt's going to be with him in that second groove of this restart. And Eberhardt's been the leader the last couple of laps under that green flag run as they come back off turn number four. Vincent on the bottom, Ewing on the top. And Vincent gets going. Ewing gets going as well. But a great jump. For Vincent and that number 13, he's going to get away out front as they head back down into turn one. And they are scattering one car all the way to the bottom of the track there, down to the banking in turn one. Vincent now off and going away in a big, big battle here. Bruce Pearson struggling with speed position, also sleep up and slipping back pretty quickly. One car ducking down to pit road, I believe. That's Dylan Jones in the 11. I wonder if that's an unscheduled pit stop. Couldn't quite tell what was going on with him, but all sorts of trouble all over the place here for a lot of these guys. In the meantime, though, still Vincent at the front of the field, Ewing in second, and then you've got Everhart at third, Seth DeMerchant very quietly up to fourth, Sean Castro in fifth. He needs this run as badly as anybody, and has got to try and hold off everybody else because he needs 10 spots over Ross Cato, but Edger Farina is now to the bottom tried to get underneath him and clears him and now it's david washington underneath the 46 and casto is going backwards at the absolute worst time in this race at yeah, casto going backwards one car that we're watching uh ewing had stayed out in that long run to try and get some track position he got the caution he needed as did vincent and ewing right now james running third holding his ground a little bit not as quick as those guys that are closing in on him but he's holding his ground right now if he can get a couple of short runs here might have a shot at making
taking uh, the next round of the playoffs. Of course, he came in a couple of points out. And obviously, as they run right now, he's going to be right there on the brink of it. Casto, though, backing up. And at number 46, he's not having the same luck as that machine. Definitely not as quick as he needs it to be right now. He's going the wrong direction as we close in now. Just about 40 laps to go here tonight at the Monster Mile. Up front, James, battle for the lead. Everhart on the bottom, Vincent on the top. And that's going to be no contest. Won't be an issue there. Everhart back to the front. That's not a surprise. Dwayne Vincent to second with solid track position. Looks like he, if he can hang up to that, should be safely in the round of 12. I think the battle to watch here now on track. Shane Ewing with that track position in third. Now ahead of Roth Cato by a solid 11 positions. And he only needed, I believe, five points on Roth Cato here to jump into the round of 12. So now the pressure is on Ross Cato. As it stands, he's got to get to, I believe, the eighth position in order to maintain his place in the round of 12. And then there's trouble in the back straight away. David Washington gets clipped. Carl Shedd goes around. Yellow flag comes out again. Do they collect anybody? Yes. One car is in it. And it's Ross Cato, who we just talked about and just ran into trouble at the worst time, and that could be Ross Cato's playoff right there in an incident that wasn't even his own doing. Well, Cato's definitely going to have at least a couple of laps on pit row. Very, very severe damage to the front of that car there. Uh, you caught it as it happened. Why don't you tell us what happened? I missed that as they came off turn number two and back down the back straight away. They came out of the back straightaway. David Washington came up and set the merchant ever so slightly, and he came right across, set the merchant's front. <laughs> and then when they came back down the track, when Washington came back down the track, he clipped shed. They both went up into the outside retaining wall in turn three, and then Ralph Cato was just right there on the outside trying to avoid it. Just had nowhere to go. Got right in the heart of the mess. Oh, boy, what a tough break for him. He's going to... Obviously have a lot of damage and it's taking out some of our front runners as well. And James, we had mentioned what strategy would do. It stuck these guys a little bit further back than they had been the whole night. And unfortunately, they're involved in this incident. Uh, it's now we're under 40 laps to go here tonight. And a lot of the car is now coming on pit road as well. And this is where we may see some strategy, James. These guys have not been out here that long on the set of tires. A lot of complicated little strategy bits, I think, all over the place. Looks like Shane Ewing might well have come down pit road for tires and fuel to fix his car up, but just a lot, a lot of guys everywhere here. Vincent came down pit road. Everhart came down pit road. They'll lead everybody off. And then you had Freenars, who I believe was third in the battle on pit road. Ewing was fourth to Merchant fifth here not a lot of damage on the 57 after that incident either which i think is interesting so looks like he got away with that pretty cleanly casto was able i think to hang on to some of the track position there was able to come down to get tires so he's at least level on tires with everybody else now which will help but he still got to find a way to drive a little bit harder here because now i think he may end up racing Shane Ewing for that last spot now that Cato should inevitably fall out of contention having been caught up in that wreck. A tough break for Cato. He's obviously now going to be outside the top 20. At number 12, he sits on pit road. Of course, we saw some pretty severe front end damage to his car, knocking the nose piece right off. So uh, obviously a big factor towards this playoffs. We've seen this come out of nowhere, but we had mentioned, James, if you remember back at the top of the show, uh, excuse me, that things like this could happen. And uh, Monster Mile grabbing a couple and hitting them right back out with a lot of damage on their race cars in the final stages of this one as we're getting ready for another restart. And we are under 40 laps to go, James. What kind of things are we going to look for on this restart as we get down towards the final stages? A madhouse. An absolute madhouse. And it's not something that they claim either for all you Anthrax fans out there. It's going to be absolutely crazy, and especially for Shane Ewing and Sean Casto. Casto has got to finish five positions ahead of Ewing just to even have a chance to make it into the round of 12. He's currently two behind the 32 machine. So the 46 may be the man with elbows out more so than anybody else in this field because he's got to. That's his only way to keep any sort of hopes he has to get into Homestead Miami alive. 
uh, these guys coming back towards the line. That quest for Homestead obviously continuing here tonight. It's uh, second to uh, say goodbye to a couple of these drivers in their championship hopes. Looks like James, unfortunately, Cato going to be one of those guys involved in that wreck. Field doubling back up now. Looks like we're just about set to go back to the green flag. So James, I want to give you a little bit of a rundown of the order. Daniel Ebhart continues to show the way with uh, Vincent on the front row with him. Vincent James was part of that group that stayed out on that long run. He has not been running in the front all night. Just was just outside the top 10 for a long time, but he's going to put himself on that front row with 135 laps complete. We're going to come back to a restart, and it looks like right now 19 cars on the lead lap. Cato still on pit road. It looks like his championship hopes are starting to go down the drain as we get set to go back of the green flag you know probably out of this championship as of now so if you're watching that last spot on the playoffs it is just about heads up between shane ewing and sean casto for it now that kato will drop out of contention and dwayne vincent ever consistent as always the lafayette louisiana driver not necessarily the absolute fastest this season but he's got the experience to stay up there and make it happen where he needs to green flag back out here on lap 135 35 to go here for the monster mile 35 laps to go. We see the green flag go back in the air. Never Hart takes control. Back down into turn number one. That second place is going to be the battle. Vincent going to lose that position in that number 13. Demerchant's right there as well. We're going to watch Ewing in that number 32. Trying to get that last playoff position. Shuts the door on his closest challenger. Casto down into turn number three. They roll back off of turn number four. Casto now ahead of Ewing like he needs to be, but he's got to hope some of these drivers behind him knock Shane Ewing back a little bit because he would still be in the good here by four points over the 46 so uh, that I think is probably his best chance because we know the speed of the guys ahead of Sean Castell it's a good run for top five right now but everyone Freenard you know, Vincent and Merchant all of them are really really fast all night yeah, I wonder if Freenars has got anything for Eberhardt in the final stages. Of course, we talked earlier about Dylan Jones, one of the dominant cars in this race in the early stages. He's minus one to the field right now, hoping a caution comes out because he would be the car in the lucky dog position. Eberhardt's been the other dominant car today uh, here this evening, but a couple of guys that were dominant, of course, out of it now. So a little bit of a different complexion at the front of the pack with Freenars sitting second, Vincent third, the merchant right now fourth. Casto fifth and Ewing sixth, but James Ewing's got a heavy set of pressure behind him. The 44, Kalisa on the 97, 42, the 24. All these guys bearing down on him, and he has got a lot of pressure onto him with 30 some laps to go here in this race as he's losing a couple of positions, and those are crucial points to him off turn two. Here we go, Brandon Bowie now clears the number 32 machine as does Lionel Callisto. so the gap now to Sean Castro is just two points so the 46 with even more to chase for because he's right on the rear poker and Seth the merchant and it might not get any easier for Ewing because here comes the 24 Nick Silver trying to get around the 32. Uh, I don't think it's going to get too much easier here for Ewing he showed earlier he's got about a 15th place car on speed based on the cars that are left out here and right now he's starting to back up a little bit as Casto takes a look on the merchant that's another crucial point now Castle knows what's going on he needs to get as many positions as possible I'm sure he's keeping monitor on that he's all over the merchant there in the battle for fourth meanwhile Ewing continues to backslide silver is all over him the battle for eighth as they come back off turn number four and if you're wondering by the way Daniel Leverhart's jumped out to about a second lead and then Freedars and Vincent are holding serve about three car lengths ahead of Demerchant there, and they're tied together for second and third. So not too much ahead of this that we can report on. But Nick Silver gets around Sean Castell, so it is a one-point gap between Sean Castell and Shane Ewing for that final spot in the round of 12. Nice edge might be one way to put it, but I'm not even sure if your nerves are that thin at this point. They are afraid completely beyond belief if you're either one of those two right now. Bill coming back down the back straightaway back into turn number three. We're watching Ewing. Uh, those guys, those of you maybe just joining us, Ewing right now a couple spots out in the championship coming into the race. He's challenging the 46 of Castro for that final position. And uh, Castro 
One thing we got to keep monitor on, James, he's got some pressure behind him. I know he's trying to get around the merger, but he's got a couple cars right with him. And we're down to just 25 laps to go. And Daniel Overhart comes back to the start finish line. That battle for third, fourth, fifth, sixth, very close. And uh, the best thing for Ewing would be to see Castell lose a couple positions to him, even though right now Ewing's got a good gap to the guy in front of him and the guy behind him. So he's kind of just settling there. Castell's got some pressure behind. He's got to start making a move on the merchant if he wants to get going. He's got to, because that would put him tied on points, but it might not matter here because it looks like Brandon Bowie and Lionel Callisto are coming. How much speed do you have if you are the 46 machine? And just what can you draw out of that number 46, that sort of military green, forest green, hunter green, some form of deep green? I, I'll admit I'm not that well versed in my Pantone colors, but that green and bright red machine. If you got any more speed out of that car, you've got to get it and you've got to find it now. Build back into turn number one. We'll watch that battle for the fourth position to Merchant and Casto. Right there, close to each other. If you're wondering still, as James mentioned, Everhart continues to open up the gap at the front of the pack. Behind them though, we're watching the battle for the final playoff position as they come off of turn number four back to the strike they come and head back down into turn number one that battle for that fourth position is going to decide a lot of things here tonight james is ewing under pressure pressure now as well silver has gotten around them bounce stick right behind them as well all kind of battles on the racetrack we need to keep monitor on it's tough to watch everything at once but we've still got 20 laps to go to decide who's going to be heading to the next round it's going to be tight, it's going to be close. Now watching here, David Comstock, and we'll see if he can do anything to catch Shane Ewing. Castro still in trouble now. He's lost another position to Seth the Merchant. Might lose another one here to Lionel Calisto, so he's sliding back, and this is everything that Shane Ewing wanted to see. Back across they come, heading back towards, towards turn number one, and the Merchant in the 57, able to hold off for now. These guys are really getting close now, James, with 20 laps to go. There's a lot of cars right here, and if one of them slips up, it could collect a ton of others. We saw that earlier. If there's a little bit of a jam up, there's absolutely nowhere to go. Right now, Demerchant trying to hang on, but it's going to be hard for him to hold off Castle in the final stage of this race. Meanwhile, again, looking at Ewing. Hay has got some pressure now as well. Castle, a little bit loose through turn number one. He's just trying to hang on and get a run on Demerchant in the battle for fourth position he's got Kalisto all over him and now he's under fire as they head back for three it's trouble for Sean Castro it's the last thing he wanted to see because all of these guys have caught up to him and the margin that he had over Shane Ewing is now going little by little by little by little it's I mean I, I can't even imagine how close it's going to get. It nearly got really close there for because Lionel Kalisto almost made contact with the 46, and that allowed Brandon Bowie to get underneath the 97, so he might have a run here to go grab the six spot away. And that's going to give uh, Castro in the number 46 a little bit of breathing room to get away from those guys as he chases the position for the merchant. Oh, contact there coming off turn two. And what a save by the merchant, but he's not going to save it. He hits the outside wall, comes down to the bottom, and another big wreck here at the end of the back straight away. James, multiple cars collected, and Casto and the merchant getting together to start that all off. Castle and the merchant got together. Gabe Wood got caught up in it. Seth the merchant got caught up in it. Trevor Rapolo got caught up in it, but guess who did not? Even though Brandon Bowie did, Shane Ewing came through that clean, and I think that will be maybe not necessarily exactly what Sean Casto wanted to see. You don't want to see any sort of playoff rival taken out in a crash the same way that Ross Cato did, but it still means that the gap is not enough, and a few of those cars that were racing alongside both of them are now out of the picture. That may end up helping Ewing more than it hurts. A tough break for Demergent as well, who had been trying to hold off that position. We're going to see some pit stops, James, with 15 laps to go. As they come back to the line, the money stop, they'll call it for Daniel Everhart. As he leads the field back onto the Monster Mile pit lane, down to just 15 laps to go when they come to the stripe. See if we see anybody in that championship fight try to make a two-tire change to get out towards the front and hope that the last couple of these laps become theirs. They're all back on the pit lane for the final pit stops. What we think will be the final pit stops of the night. 
Just execute. Just execute. That's all you can ask for. All that you're hoping for with any of these drivers and all that you want to see here. And uh, we'll see what goes down here on pit road and if there are any issues to be had. Clean pit stops, it looks like, for everybody to be led by Daniel Everhart, barely over Andrew Freenors, then Lano Kalisto, then Dwayne Vincent, then Sean Casto, Nick Silver, Shane Ewing, Gabe Wood, David Comstock, Tano Salarico, Eric Stanford, Nelson Rivera, Sean Boundy, Austin Coop, Bruce Pearson. So we'll let everything reset there and see what happened, but just a wild, wild set of circumstances there late in the going. And it's up right for a couple of those guys running towards the championship involved in that. When we mentioned Ewing, that's really going to benefit Ewing in that number 32. Able to get through it and continue in his machine. And it looks like he is going to be in that position, James, that all crucial position to try and advance into the next round of the playoffs as they come back across the line. Just 14 laps to go. We're clicking these right off here tonight. It's been a great battle up at the front, a great battle in the middle of the pack. And uh, getting down to the final stages, we're going to decide who goes to victory lane here tonight at the Monster Mile. I cannot take my eyes off this Casto Ewing battle as it stands, unless we see something happen in front of them. But it's been pretty consistently Daniel Everhart's race ever since he got around Dylan Jones about a third of the way through, except there is maybe the biggest penalty of this race so far an eol for sean casto for claiming the caution there getting into the merchant and setting that all up so casto will go to the back of the grid and that in all likelihood will kill his shot at the playoffs and move shane ewing into the round of 12. Yeah, we're going to see if Casto can work his way back through. James, of course, still going to have some laps to do it to try and pick up some of those positions, but not going to be easy. We've been talking all night about how difficult it is to use uh, both of these lanes to try and make a pass. Well, he's going to have to do it pretty quickly if he wants to get to the front of the field. Now, as they come back down to the line, they're going to get, looks like, possibly the one to go here, and it looks like we'll set up a 12-lap shootout. So 12 laps. For him to try to work his way back through the field. Ewing right now in the 32. Looks like he is going to restart in the sixth position. So he is in the capper and seek to advance to the second round. We'll get the green with just 12 more circuits to go. Pretty easy stuff here. And I guess maybe the next battle, I don't know if it'll mean much, but Casto and Rapolo might be the two that will be next in line potentially. But even then... Rapolo had 20 points on Casto, so I think it, it may well just about be over for the 46, unless they just decide to completely stack it up here at the front of the field. But restart will come on lap 158 of 170, so 13 to go when they cross the stripe. Everhart, Freenars, Kalisto, Vincent, Silver, Ewing, Wood, Comstock, Talarico, and Stanford. A nice comeback up there through the field will be your top 10 when they come back to the strike. Everhart will lead them off here of turn four. Waits, waits, stacks them up pretty well. Will wait deep in the box to get going here. Won't go all that soon. And there he goes, finally, and really, really waited there. And it almost stacked people up, and it did stack people up. It did stack people up. Caution out there again. I couldn't tell where exactly or who got hit i think this started somewhere when sean boundy checked up to make sure he didn't know he got into the back of eric stanford and then the 57 went going and i'll tell you what the one thing i saw was that daniel everhart waited very very late almost past the restart box there uh, to actually get this race restarted and unless I am wrong. I believe per RSR rules, if the leader passes the restart box has not restarted the race, then it is fair game to just go ahead and go. And I think we saw a little bit of that there. And in that case, it just all kind of stacked up the middle of the field there and got really, really tricky for a few cars. 
Well, James, you know what? Something I'm looking at, of course, is we'll take a look at the replay here to see exactly what happened. We've seen that replay now as they stacked up coming across to the green flag. But Ewing in that number 32, of course, able to escape. He's in front of it. The other guy that had taken an EOL for causing that last incident, Sean Casto. We've been monitoring him in the championship. He, as well, able to get through that. The front straightaway and pick up some crucial positions on the track. He picked up a good five, six, seven spots. Able to get through that. It's going to put himself in position to try and make a little bit of a run at this with just about 10 laps to go. Still needs a little bit of help, though. Still will have to get a few more positions. I don't think he'd be able to do. He'd have to win the race as it stands with Ewing running in the sixth position to be level on points with the 32. And that's about the only real battle that I think you're going to see. Lionel Kalisto running in fourth will have his spot sewn up in the round of 12, as will Daniel Everhart with this run if the positions hold. Trevor Rapolo not having the greatest of evenings, but he had a 15-point buffer to Shane Ewing. And with all the drivers that got caught up in that, since he was not really one of them, not terribly, I have a feeling he's going to be just okay and just to the good of that cut line. But uh, there's enough damage on the nine machine that it will be close. So we will have to keep an eye on him. And that may be the one we have to watch now. The gap between Rapolo and Ewing. It was 15 points coming into tonight. As it stands, Ewing would be picking up, I believe, seven. So if there are any more dropouts from this race and or if Rapolo falls back, because we've still got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven cars on track behind him. It could be close. It could be really, really close. Yeah, that's something we're definitely going to have to watch. We're down now, James, under 10 laps to go. So we're going to have these answers to, to these questions we're asking in just a few more laps. That feel looking like it's starting to... Uh, Get back double file. We're going to restart with under 10 laps to go. James, we had mentioned at the top of the broadcast. And uh, why don't you share with the fans here what the rules are for the end of this race. If this race was to come down, there was a caution in the final laps. So we're going to end under yellow or will we have a green-white checker situation? Because that's something that this points could uh, really have a factor on. It could, but as per all the races here at iRacing on the sim, and this is across the board with all NASCAR races, there is no green-white checker rule in the sim. If we cross five laps to go, we have a yellow flag. We've passed the Evan Pasoko point of no return. Any yellow flag that comes out within five to go would effectively end this race under the yellow flag. So we wouldn't see any racing. And I think that's absolutely a possibility that we have to look out for because we've come down to the end of this race. We've got yellow flags here. And not to quote our old friend Daryl Waltrip, but this very much seems like a case of cautions breeding cautions. And just a lot of guys trying to gain position, gain ground. And they're literally running over each other trying to get towards the front of the field, which... And just ends up causing more cautions and makes it harder for anybody deep in the pack to be able to get up towards the front. Well, James, it's like we're ready for this restart. We're going to have about seven laps to go when they get the green. Everhart continues to go the way in his number 90. He's been the uh, really the dominant factor of the second half of this race. He took the lead in the uh, first half from Dylan Jones and has really been the dominant car throughout the second half of the event. One guy we have not talked a lot about so far uh, in the second half of this race, James, would be Nick Silver running back there in the fifth spot. The guys that are right around Ewing in that number 32. Ewing, again, needing these points to get to the next round of the playoffs. Guys like Silver and Tellerico and Wood were right there with him. If they take positions away from him, it could hurt his chances at being in the next round. We'll watch Casto come from 15th on this race start. James, here we go with seven to go with the green. Everhart gets going much earlier this time around, and it'll be a much cleaner restart, it looks like, all around for most of these drivers. A few drivers towards the back of the pack didn't really get going, but not going to be an issue here for Everhart. He goes clear, so does Freenorth, so does Vincent, Kalisto, all good, Silver, and Tanner and Chaldo Rico with a nice front here. And it's Shane Ewing that's under fire again this time from David Comstock, who's rebounding from that early slap on the wall, and Gabe Wood, who was around not too long ago up in turn three, now back running in the top ten with Nelson Rivera underneath him. 
Yeah, they come back off of turn number two. We're watching Casto as well, trying to gain some positions. He gained three on the restart right away. He's closing on a group of cars. Here he's going to have one car in front of him, that being Bruce Pearson in number 22. He's going to have to get around him quickly because this time by down under now to five laps to go when they come back to the start finish line. So this one coming right down to the final stages as we expected at the beginning of the night. The championship coming right down to the final laps as well with who is going to advance to the next round. It looks like up front, James, don't want to shy away from that championship battle. We may have a battle for the win brewing now as Everhart continues to show the way. Everhart really starting to click these laps off very, very nicely. Faridars might be the one that has something in it for him, but he's going to have to start making moves quickly here because we're going to get down to it. Five laps to go. Vincent now just holding off Calisto and Nick Silver. He's having a pretty solid run there in the fifth position, and Ewing is doing everything that he needs to in order to hang on to a spot in the round of 12. Back off of turn number two comes Eberhardt. He shows the way in the final laps of this one. As that battle for that final position looks like James Ewing is in the position he needs to be in. He looks like he's just riding there. That pit strategy call we'll have to talk about uh, throughout this race. We'll be talking about the pit strategy. We have to talk about what Ewing did staying out on that long green flag run, not pitting when a lot of others did, and taking advantage of a caution flag to stay out and get some track position. Right now running seventh with Castro back. Uh, Castro back in the 11th position. It looks like Ewing's going to be that guy to advance to the next round as Eberhardt showing the way with just a couple laps to go. Daniel Harverhart doing it the same way he did here when the summer began at Dover. Was incredibly quick on that last green flag run. And though Farinars is trying to give him the best challenge he possibly can, Pretty easy goings, it looks like, for the number 90 machine. He'll come across the strike to get the white flag this time by. One more circuit around for Eberhardt as he rolls down into turn number one. That battle for the lead looks like it's going to go to Eberhardt. Looks like Ewing in that number 32. Going to finish about seventh, and that may be enough. James, why don't you take us to the finish as they roll down into three. Daniel Everhart with a strong run, the strongest car all night long, and a strong way to punch your ticket into the round of 12. Daniel Everhart gets the race victory here and sweeps the season at Dover. Andrew Farigars comes home second. Dwayne Vincent caught the caution at the perfect time and held on to that track position to come home third. Lionel Calisto fourth, Nick Silver fifth, and Shane Ewing finishes in the seventh spot, four positions ahead of Sean Casto, and I believe 11 ahead of Trevor Rapolo. and unofficially, it looks like Shane Ewing will be the last driver of the 12 to make it into the round of 12. So James looks like Everhart now doing his burnouts on the front straightaway. A well, a well deserved win. Definitely James was the fastest car in the second half of that race. Uh, I have to talk to him as the interview, see about that front end damage. Didn't look like that really affected him at all. But the pit strategy, we talked. I talked about at the beginning of the uh, broadcast, how uh, the pit strategy may play a factor, and it looks like it did with Ewing able to get himself into the next round, of course, unofficially for now, but able to get himself in at number 32. A little bit of strategy helps him out there tonight. We'll find out the answers to all these questions on the other side of this commercial break, but... We need to sort everything out and get everybody lined up. So we'll talk to Daniel Everhart and more here once we roll through these advertisements. But we'll remind you one more time that you are watching coverage of the RealSimRacing.com Full Throttle Cup Series presented by Gary Mercer Trucking on LSR TV, your home for sim racing.
So, so cool, yeah. Um, Nate, what are you working on at the moment? Uh, so I'm working on the animation for the game. Uh, we're working on getting pit crews fully developed, and that involves uh, a lot of moving parts. So I'm going in and making sure that each moving part can uh, dovetail smoothly into the next one, so that when you pull in for a pit stop, it, uh, it looks like the real thing, as opposed to a bunch of jumbled pieces that suddenly stop and then go and, and stuff like that. Yeah, that's so cool, but why aren't you working on the time model? Nothing? I racing, you wanted the best, you got them for a breast. Often imitated, never duplicated, the greatest show on earth. Welcome back to coverage of the RealSimRacing.com Full Throttle Cup Series presented by Gary Mercer Trucking here on LSR TV. With a round of 16 is completed, Daniel Eberhardt wins the final of the three races in this first round and sweeps the season at Dover. And at this point, we are going to go ahead and run through our full field rundown to see where your favorite driver finished tonight. Eberhardt picks up another win on the season here with this number 90 Powertech Ford Fusion at Dover. Gets it done tonight with a very, very strong run all the way throughout. Farinars finishes in second. Dwayne Vincent took advantage of the track position that he gained when that yellow flag came out right in the middle of the pit stop cycle and just never left the top five from there, was able to finish third. Lionel Calisto came home in the fourth position. Nick Silver was fifth. Tanner Tallarico finished sixth. Shane Ewing finishes seventh unofficially. He is the last man to get a spot in the round of 12. David Comstock finished eighth. Nelson Rivera, ninth. And Gabe Wood rounds out the top 10. Just outside the top 10, James Castro missing. Looks like the next round finishing in 11th. Dylan Jones, the early race leader, 12th. Austin Coop uh, coming on late to finish 13th. Jason Cameron Jr., 14th. And Bruce Pearson, guy we didn't talk about much all night, finishing in 15th. Says the Merchant was 16th. Carl Shedd, 17th. Trevor Rapolo back there in the 18th position. Sean Bounty was the last car in the lead lap in 19th. And Eric Stanford. Rounds out the top 20, 11 laps down at the finish of this one here tonight. All these cars ran into trouble late in the going or were out of the race. Brandon Bowie finishes in 21st this evening. David Washington was 22nd. He got into it with Carl Shedd midway through the race and was out of contention from there. Ross Cato got caught up in the same incident, was running in a position to be in the round of 12 at the time. And the hard luck falls on the side of the 12 and he will miss the next round of the playoffs and is eliminated at this stage. Finishes 23rd on the night. 24th belonged to Corey Wolf in the 16th. Douglas Wyatt in the 33 car finishes 25th. A.J. Browning comes home 26th. Joseph LaPlaca was 27th. Rod Flag 28th. And Giovanni Bramante finishes 29th to round out the field. And that will be your full field rundown for the 28th race of 36. 2017 Full Throttle Cup Series season at Dover. Great race here tonight, James, and uh, we're going to start talking to some of the drivers that ran close to the front of the field here tonight. Of course, a couple guys in the middle of that race losing positions at the front due to incidents. We saw an incident there with David Washington, who was running at the front. Carl Shedd was well involved in one, uh, I believe, the same one there in the middle part of the race. So a couple guys that had been running in the front, not able to finish up there, but Daniel Eberhardt, obviously, definitely the dominant car in the second half of the race and able to take down the win. A strong run. A very, very strong run from Daniel Eberhardt to get it done at Dover once again. Pretty good track record here. You come here twice, you win both races. I wonder if you might just want to come back here and run this race every week, Daniel, maybe? Yeah, I would love to run this racetrack every week. It's a fun racetrack. Uh, 
I really enjoy it uh, all week long. This has uh, been really competitive this week, and it feels good to run up there with my teammates finally. I've been struggling. I struggled at New Hampshire last week, so it feels really good to be up at the front this week. And the strength of this car with the way that thing was set up, it felt like all you really had to do was get to Dylan Jones, and then once you got past him, this was your race through and through from pretty much there on out. So uh, I take it that notebook is something that you protect with a pot of gold because it didn't really seem like you had to race that hard tonight. The, the car was so strong underneath you that it was just really, really easy for you to plant that thing wherever you wanted it to go. Yeah, James, it was... Uh... It was all about keeping throttle control, and uh, if you keep your exits up under you, and you don't want the rear end sliding out from under you each and every lap, and uh, it's all about saving your tires here. And the, the track in the corners, it kind of keeps the car hunkered down, like the rear end hunkered down. And all you got to do is be easy getting on the throttle. And uh, me and Andrew all week long have been racing, and I felt like we were probably the two best this week. Uh, I knew Dave and them wouldn't be as strong. This isn't one of Dave's strong suit tracks, but as these weeks get you know, into the chase and everything, it's going to fall into Dylan and Dave's hands. This is this is usually what happens. Dave just gets through this round, and then he'll start firing off in the next round, and there'll be guys like Comstock and all them guys. We'll all be right there together at the end of this. And we move on into the round of 12, so we'll have Charlotte, Kansas, and Talladega next on the schedule. Uh, you had speed at Charlotte and Kansas, didn't quite get the finishes that you wanted, but a good finish at Daytona in your only plate race of 2017. What do you look for out of yourself amongst these three tracks as we go into the round of 12? Uh, Charlotte is going to be a hit or miss because we're running in daylight. It's going to be a lot different, you know, and Charlotte's going to be a lot slicker. It's going to be a lot more of a handful than the night. The night's so locked down, you're just pretty much wide open the whole time until your tires wear off. And then you go to Talladega. Vega is a crapshoot, but everybody that knows me knows I love plate racing, and I want to be there leading every single lap, and I want to be leading it at the end. And Andrew loves them too, so I'm pretty sure all of us in Aegis are going to hook up at the end of that thing and try to, you know, see what we got at the end and try to get one of us at least in victory lane and then going to kansas you're rim riding the whole time and i i love to run the outside at kansas and the last time we were there i think i, I won there not this year but uh the last season we were here during the fall race i want to say i won that race too so uh it's going to be fun and uh we'll look forward to getting to these tracks with the whole ages group before we let you go and prepare for the round of 12 as always we'll give you your chance to send your sponsors and your shout outs your thank yous you love to everybody so who makes it happen for you and this number 90 team first off i gotta thank the good lord above because if it wasn't for him none of this would be possible uh and i gotta uh thank all the aegis guys it's it's great running with these guys each and every week andrew carl trevor ross dylan dave and then andy and uh Eric, it's just a bunch of great guys. Uh, then you got Steve who's helping out. And happy birthday to Steve. This wins for him. And uh, just thoughts and prayers go out to everything that's happening in the, in the world these days. It's uh, hard to see that happen on our homeland in the Las Vegas and then stuff that's happening all around the coast with all the hurricanes. And just it's hard to it's hard to see this. And But we got to move on from it and be strong as a nation and come together and i gotta thank my beautiful girlfriend and uh also this week we're running special paint schemes the pink car is out and remember ladies to always go get checked because at the end of the day if it wasn't for you guys none of us would be possible too many points there for me to individually agree with all of them so i'll just say that i agree with all of them and say thank you for the time daniel and we'll talk to you uh, maybe next week depends on the finish, but have a feeling you'll at least be in contention for a chat here next Monday night. Thank you, James. There's Daniel Everhart, your race winner, his fourth victory of 2017 and second at Dover, sweeps the season here at the Monster Mile and gets it done in easy and convincing fashion to make it into the round of 12. And from Mr. Everhart, we slide right down out of victory lane onto pit road where Andrew Farinars is waiting for us and hanging out ever so slightly and will be here to talk to us in just a moment, Kyle, but you can't 
say it enough, just a very, very impressive run for Mr. Friedars, who actually has found his way over here and decided to take his mouth off the water bottle. So, Mr. Friedars, that was a wild race. You were up in the top five for a good chunk of it, and then all of a sudden, bam, here you are right at the front of the field with, you know, just a handful of laps to go. Can you take us through how you navigated everything? Yeah, just uh, really had a top five car, no better. Um, Dave definitely ran better. Uh, Dylan was definitely better. They had their uh, fair share of problems. And I really just kind of right place, right time. Uh, we had that green flag stop, and then, um, you know, we had that green flag stop there and just was able to get ahead of uh, Dylan and Dave there. And Dave had his problems with that crash and everything. Uh, from there, man, just really uh, trying to catch Daniel. Uh, once we got around those slower cars, it was second, but Daniel just class of the field. We weren't able to get to him. That was really what uh, the race was like for me. But you come out of here with a really, really strong finish, an easy spot in the round of 12, and all of a sudden here, you're sitting on a stretch here. You haven't finished outside of the top 10 since the Michigan race. And if we exclude the Michigan race, you have to go all the way back to the first Michigan race, incidentally, to find the last time that you finished outside of the top 10. So the momentum is there. The consistency is there. How big is that for you and this 88 team going into the round of 12? Uh, really big, uh, especially coming up with Charlotte track. I really, really struggle at, but, uh, it's good to have good finishes, especially here at Dover, uh, track. I would consider my home track. I was lucky enough to go to the, uh, monster energy race yesterday, you know, kind of learn something that I could apply in the sim here. So just really, really good to get a good finish. Um, happy with second, wish we could have got a win, but, uh, we'll, we'll settle. You say you don't really like Charlotte all that much, but you got a top five out of it when we were there in May and a finished runner-up when we were at Kansas in May. So I would have to believe you've got to get a little bit more confidence than that going into those two races, yeah? Yeah, um, I've done some practice with this new build. It's just a uh, track I struggle at. So uh, we'll be hard at work uh, practice this week, and Hopefully we can just get better. Uh, we did have the fifth place run last time. Not really, uh, my memory's not too good. Not really sure how I pulled that off. But, uh, you know, nice to know that I did get a top five and maybe uh, it'll be better than I think it is. Well, in the meantime, we'll let you get prepared here for the round of 12. But before we do, uh, one chance to go ahead and send your thank yous and your shout outs and your love to everybody that makes it happen for you in this 88 team. Yeah. Uh, Thoughts and prayers, really, with everyone uh, in Las Vegas affected by uh, that shooting. Just a terrible, terrible tragedy, and uh, I hope everyone out there recovers okay and their family's safe. Um, Got to say thanks to my brother for building the computer to run the sim. Without him, that ain't possible. Uh, all the support from my mom, my dad, uh, my grandpa. Um, Sean, uh, Steve is on the box tonight. He did a great job. Really, all my friends and family and everyone on this Aegis team, from Dave, uh, always there when you need a helping hand. Dylan's always there. Carl. Uh, Andy's put these paints on every single week. Does a great job. Uh, breast cancer awareness tonight. Carl looks sharp, like in the pink. And uh, really, just everyone on this Aegis Power Tech team, they do a great job. Well, thank you for the time, Andrew. Congrats on your second place finish here at Dover, and we will see you one week from today, or tonight, rather, in Charlotte. Thanks so much. Look forward to it. There's Andrew Farinar's runner-up here tonight at Dover, and I will send it over to Mr. Kyle Souza, who has caught up with the third-place driver in this race, and that would be Lafayette, Louisiana's number 13, Dwayne Vincent. Yeah, Dwayne Vincent, uh, we'll bring him in here using a little bit of pit strategy there, James Solid. Uh, Dwayne, not James, James. Helping me talk to you. Uh, Dwayne in here finishing third. Dwayne used that pit strategy there in the middle of the race, uh, much like Shane Ewing did, to stay out on that long run and uh, try and get some track position. It seems like to us that it kind of worked for you here tonight, don't you think? Well, actually, I got lucky. I was, gonna, I was going in the pit, and I was going to miss the uh, commitment line, I guess you'd call it, and uh, I was going to get a black flag, so I got back out on the track, 
I was going to go in the, the next time around, and right when I was going in, the caution came out. So really, I got lucky. We'll I guess, take it. I guess sometimes it's better to be lucky than good, right? That's correct. So talk about the car. I mean, the middle part of the race that you ran a little bit outside the top 10, did you have to work on the car a lot, or did you feel like the car was good? It was just tough to get through the field. It, it was it was tough, man. It was hard to pass, but I was horrible on long runs. I was killing the right front. I tried to run up high, the middle, low. It, no matter where I went, I was still killing it. I just couldn't figure out the line. But, um, yeah, um, running in the top 10, and then just got lucky with this caution deal. and. I was kind of holding up the guys with two or three to go behind me. I'm glad they uh, had some patience, but uh, we'll take third any way we can. Well, I know third place finish is definitely going to be a conference booster for anybody, and I know it's been a uh, a great conference booster for you tonight here to be able to run up towards the front there after you stayed out and got a little bit lucky, as you mentioned. I know there's been some people that have been helping you get the car prepared and uh, supporting you here tonight to get you towards the front and have a great finish like this. Why don't you give them a shout-out? Yeah, I want to thank uh, Doug Wife with uh, Hippie's Paint Shop, uh, Corey Wolf, John Abbott, Doug Roth. That's all the guys with uh, HPS. Um, and John Abbott for doing everything to get LSR, I mean, uh, RSR to where it's at today. And I want to thank all the guys at LSR for taking over and hopefully moving this thing over into the future and um, keeping, it, keeping it going. Uh, we all really uh, appreciate it. And thank you all for everything you all done. Well, Dwayne, we uh, wish you the best of luck next week at Charlotte. We'll talk to you there. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to miss Charlotte. I, I, I got a meeting uh, out of town next week, so I'm going to miss Charlotte. It's killing me. So I'm going to have to either win Talladega or Kansas. It's going to be tough. Well, looks like we'll talk with James and uh, Dwayne in a couple of weeks. So, Dwayne, uh, yeah. enjoy, enjoy your trip. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. All right. Thank you. Uh, that's Dwayne Vincent coming home third. And, uh, James, we've been talking about the championship chase all night long. Uh, here at Dover International and uh, the Monster Mile. Looks like it's going to be a benefit to Shane Ewing finishing 7th on the grid and uh, James, we're waiting for him. Looks like he's going to jump in here and talk to us too about getting into the round of 12 here in the playoffs. We do, we do. We've got Shane Ewing here up in the booth and we do have confirmation from Race Control that you are the 12th and final man into the round of 12 and I think your night really starts, Shane, with the struggles in the beginning of this race. You didn't have a lot of speed. You were kind of stuck in the middle of traffic there. And then all of a sudden, you make that gamble to stay out just a little bit longer, and it pays off for you. First off, what went into the decision to stay out in particular? Yeah, that was a Doug Flutie move. I um, had to throw a Hail Mary at it because I just didn't have – the setup um, that I could go up there and pass cars. I had um, practiced all week on the NIS fixed and thought I had something decent, but we got into the server and I was just off. So I went back on, on some settings and um, it was safer. I wasn't getting loose off the corner, but I just burned the tires up in a matter of a few laps. So um, I knew I just did the beginning part of the race. I just had to stay out of trouble. I knew, you know, Dover's got a chance to, uh, at you know eight ten car wrecks and then wanted to get to halfway so that was one of the reasons i was at the back and then we got that long green flag run and and i thought about short pitting but i was going to go two laps down if i did so i said well i got to throw a hail mary one way or other i got to come in 20 laps before these guys and hope it stays green um or i got to stay out so i just decided to stay out as long as i possibly could and when the caution came out um and um i heard that ross was in it i mean i hate it for him but it, it certainly benefited me then then i knew um i just had to finish six spots ahead of him i knew that going in so um the rest of the race was just trying to stay clean but uh there was all the pressure was off then you know through the hail mary in the end zone i suppose technically speaking that's true but at least from what we saw it looked like in that final 40 to 50 lap run you were just absolutely driving with your arms as rocks and just had nothing left in it because you had to hold off three or four cars at different points throughout those final few runs there just to be able to maintain your position. But I thought it was impressive. Once you got the track position, you were able to stay up there, and that 32 car all of a sudden looked pretty quick. I honestly was just not trying to wear the tires off of it, and uh, I actually let a couple cars go um, there the first few laps of a restart and just tried to settle in somewhere um, and knew that, that I had to finish 
you know, better than 17th. <laughs> That's really all I was thinking about the last 20 some laps. But uh, uh, certainly a lot more fun when you're closer to the front and the pressure's off of, of uh, you know, having to pass cars to do it. So, um, uh, lucky. Uh, kind of like Ricky Stenhouse uh, yesterday. Uh, lucky to be here, but I've got to run better. Um, than I did this segment um, if I want to move further forward than this. So we've got a lot of work to do. Do you have a sense of what needs to happen here to improve for Charlotte, Kansas, and Talladega and everything that we're going to expect here in the round of 12? Well, I need to I need to figure out a way to, to better simulate the dynamic tracks uh, with all the track buildup we have here. And, um, you know, it's just... The, the, the load stars come down to Brandon and I, and, and I become so much of a better driver with his help. He's got so much talent. Um, but, you know, it's just two of us. I can't simulate that just running laps with him. So I've been doing the NIS series. So uh, I'm going to talk to some guys and, and, and see if I can figure out a way to, to just better simulate race conditions. Um, so a little bit better prepared when we get to the racetrack here on Monday nights. Before we let you go, who do you need to thank in order for getting you to the round of 12 and giving you the support you needed to make it this far in the playoffs? Uh, first of all, Lodestar Racing, uh, Brandon Bowie, like I said before, he's been been a huge help to me, and, and we really work well together. Um, I want to thank all you guys at LSR TV. You put on a hell of a broadcast, and I've told you before that my mom watches from her house every week and texts me afterwards and lets me know how she thought I did. So I, I love that she's able to do that. Uh, thank my wife, Christina, and my girls, Haley and Ashley, for letting me put so much time into this. It's it's uh, it's something I love to do, but it takes a lot of time to try and be good at it. So I appreciate them giving me that time. Um, so thanks for uh, for having me up here tonight. I don't get to come up here very often, and uh, hopefully it's not the last time this year we can, we can you know catch lightning in a bottle. Or battery lightning in the bottle, perhaps? Nice. I like that. I mean, it's on the logo, so, you know, not that hard of a stretch. But we will look forward to seeing you and that Rayovac car take the track next week at Charlotte. And until then, congratulations on making it to the round of 12, and we'll see you next week, Shane. Thanks, James. Appreciate it. We'll see you then. Shane Ewing, last man of the round of 12, and so your playoff field for the round of 12 is set. And it is effectively as it was before we came in here, save for the one swap of Ross Cato for Shane Ewing. So, your 12 drivers to advance are David Washington, David Comstock, Daniel Eberhardt, Dylan Jones, Brandon Bowie, Carl Shedd, Nick Silver, Andrew Freenars, Dwayne Vincent, Trevor Rompolo, Lionel Kalisto, and Shane Ewing. 12 guys, 12 really, really competitive drivers, and Charlotte comes up next, Kyle, and that's going to be very, very interesting. I think Daniel mentioned it in his interview. We haven't really seen that track run in the day and it'll be something new for this series since it mirrors the cup schedule. And traditionally, this has been a night race in the fall. It's the first time since, I believe, 2002 that this will be a day race once again. So uh, a little bit of a new dynamic here to have all that slipperiness, that greasiness return to that wonderful, wonderful racetrack back home in North Carolina. Yeah, I agree, James. I think the... Uh... The slipperiness of that track in the daytime could play a factor. We talked a lot tonight about the exit of the corner and people sliding up and getting a little bit loose. Uh, and I foresee that we will be talking about that once again next week when we get to Charlotte. Getting in the gas and staying in the gas is going to be crucial to being fast at the front of the pack. And those guys that can do that, I suspect they're going to be the guys we'll be talking about to go to victory lane next week. So we'll keep tabs on that. and. Uh, normally at this stage, this would be where we conclude tonight's coverage of the RealSimRacing.com Full Throttle Cup Series presented by Gary Mercer Trucking on LSR TV. Uh, but tonight is not a normal night. And while we do thank everybody up here at LSR TV, Kyle Souza, Cisco Scamos in the production booth, Kyle Barnes, Doug Atkinson and company running the admin show here at Real Sim Racing, Laura Lawson, DJ Lyon, and Evan Pasoko at LSR TV for all their help. Uh, two pieces of news that I think we would be remiss not to touch on here. The first is that we at LSR TV offer 
our condolences and thoughts to the families and friends of everyone affected by the shooting in Las Vegas and are wishing for the best for everybody there. And the second piece of news that will hit a little bit closer to home for us motorsports folk is that during our broadcast, we learned from Doug Yates that his father in 2018 NASCAR Hall of Fame inductee Robert Yates has passed away after a long battle with cancer at age 74. And I think the fact that he's got a Hall of Fame nomination speaks for itself. But you look at the resume that he put together and some of the names that he got to work with. He bought the team from Harry Rainier in 1988. We knew the pedigree that they had already coming in, having had Cale Yarbrough and company drive that 28 car before. But I think it took on a completely new persona with Yates and I think went to new heights. You had Davey Allison run for him, won the 1992 Daytona 500 and came oh so close to winning the 1992 Winston Cup championship. And then Ernie Irvin took it over for a time. And then he brought Dale Jarrett on in 1996. And that's really when things got going between those two Jarrett and Yates. He had two more Daytona 500s, a Brickyard 400 and the 1999 NASCAR Winston Cup championship. And, I think all of that cemented his status as one of the greatest team owners, one of the greatest engine builders in all of NASCAR, and his legacy is still there today now that Sun Doug runs the Roush Yates engine program for Ford, which is the primary engine building team for all of the Ford cars in the Cup Series. So uh, Robert Yates certainly has left a massive, massive legacy behind, and I think all of us at LSR TV offer our thoughts and condolences to him and to the Yates family as they go through this very, very difficult period. Yeah, very well said, James. And uh, of course, our thoughts and prayers with everybody, as you mentioned, involved in the Las Vegas situation, as well as Mr. Yates. And uh, glad to see that he's going to be inducted into the NASCAR Hall of Fame. I know we didn't want to see this happen before that happens, but uh, definitely going to be recognized for his achievements. And uh, as we do in all of motorsports, this is the time when the motorsports family will come together to honor him. As it tends to do, this is a group that is very, very tight in times like this. So we will close for this evening and see you next week at Charlotte. But once more, our thoughts to the people affected by the Las Vegas tragedy and our thoughts with the family and friends of Robert Yates, who has passed away this evening at the age of 74.